so here's a brutal truth. The long journey to becoming a doctor is not fun. I've never looked back on those years and thought to myself, yeah, I'd do that again. No, but I did it, and my colleagues did it, and there's medical students right now putting themselves through it. And if you're wondering why, even if you're not, I'll tell you. The answer is, it's for the patients. You see, patients give us doctors our purpose, our identity, the fulfillment, the fulfillment we get for caring for another human being during their most fragile and vulnerable moments of their lives brought on by disease, that fulfillment makes the long journey worth it and what keeps us doctors going. But let me tell you about Ms. R. Ms. R was a patient of mine early in my career who had COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now, we in the medical field, we know COPD. We have medications, we have cutting-edge research, and we have guidelines. We know COPD management. But none of that knowledge prevented Ms. R from five hospitalizations in under 12 months. Imagine spending half a year just going in and out of hospitals. That's not fulfillment, that's frustration. During one of Ms. R's hospitalizations, I actually learned a few things about her community challenges that impacted her care. Access. Ms. R told me she had to take up to three buses to get to the closest pharmacy just to pick up these COPD medications. Affordability. Ms. R lived paycheck to paycheck, and these inhalers were not cheap. In fact, the way she put it was that she felt like she had to choose between eating and breathing. And housing. You see, Ms. R lived in a building with shared air vents, meaning when her neighbors would smoke their cigarettes, that secondhand smoke would go up through those air vents into her apartment complex, she would breathe it in, and her lung disease would worsen. Ms. R wasn't just suffering from COPD, but she was suffering from ineffective medical strategies, ineffective medical strategies because I did not take into account her community or her environment. In fact, my long journey of training never included addressing patients' community issues for such a purpose. So there's a gap. There's a gap in our knowledge, there's a gap in our training. So I began to seek out community engagement. Community engagement specifically to see if I can help overcome one of those issues Ms. R brought up, access. I and several other colleagues, we had this great idea of providing a medical service directly into a community, and we were excited, but Here's where we learn our next valuable lesson about community. You see, this great idea was a cancer screening initiative. What we wanted to do was enroll as many women as possible for free mammograms. Now, we partnered with a local congregation located in an underserved area of Baltimore City. They invited us to their summer event. This church was home to over 500 parish members. That afternoon, there was tons of foot traffic coming and going, and we were excited. But at the end of the day, we only signed up two women two women for a valuable and free medical service. We were hurt, we were disappointed. So what do doctors do when they're hurt and disappointed? We ask for feedback. And the church said, sure, gladly, we'll tell you, just come to our monthly community meeting. And we did, and we showed up. And I'll never forget how this conversation began. One of the parish members, she stood up and said, Doc, no one wants to be a patient. You see, being a patient is a burden. It's a burden to oneself, it's a burden to one's family, it requires time, money, and resources, things that many of these community members did not have. But more importantly, the way they saw us that afternoon in their church was trying to convert people into patients without an ounce of trust that we would help them with that burden. Clearly, picking up a medical service and just dropping it into the community without taking into account their priorities or their struggles or having their trust, it's not a formula for fulfillment. That's a formula for failure. You see, if we doctors treat our patients without fully understanding their community, we're setting ourselves up for a disconnect. A disconnect like the one I experienced with Ms. R and a disconnect like we experienced with that failed cancer screening initiative. So what's the solution? Well, fueled by those experiences of disconnect, my colleagues and I, we were determined to create a medical community engagement that would emphasize knowing the science, knowing the patient, and knowing the community. 
in 2013, at Johns Hopkins, we launched Medicine for the Greater Good, MGG. Now, one of MGG's purpose was to teach physicians in training about the socioeconomic determinants of health, what they are, how do they impact our patients, and how can we combat them. But at the same time, MGG secured dozens of community partnerships, partnerships with churches, synagogues, mosques, partnerships with public schools, public housing units, partnerships with union halls and city hall. And these partnerships began at the grassroots, meaning we from MGG, we would show up and we'd sit down at the same table, we'd have our binders, everything's laminated and highlighted because we're doctors, and we'd sit there going over the data from the Baltimore City Health Department. But at the same time, the community members would sit down and they would tell us about the daily struggles of each local person. And here's where we recognized that disconnect, that disconnect into what health means. See, somewhere during our long journey of training, we doctors begin to view health as synonymous with medicine, prescriptions, research, guidelines. But for the community, health is more than just feeling well. Health is, health is jobs. Health is providing for your family. Health is going to church. Health is going to the park. Health is a sense of purpose. So if we are going to create effective medical strategies at the patient level and at the community level, we need to make sure everyone's voices are heard. And here's an example. At another local congregation, this one located in Southeast Baltimore City, MGG held an event called Getting to Know Your Heart. That afternoon, we were gonna talk about kidneys. No, obviously, I'm joking, the title gives it away. We're gonna be talking about the heart and heart disease. And while this event was many hours long, we really had three key recommendations. First, we emphasized the Sunday brunch after worship service. You see, we said social interaction was a great way to combat stress, and stress is a known risk factor for heart disease. Next, we talked about how to make the Sunday brunch meals nutritious, but still in accordance with their cultural preferences. At one of our meetings, the way the reverend put it was, if we can get these congregation members to think about nutrition on a Sunday, maybe it'll happen on a Monday, and then Tuesday, till every day of the week, they're thinking about nutrition. Our final recommendation was walking to church. We found out that dozens of these community members live no more than a few city blocks, so we said, great, knock on your neighbor's door and walk in pairs. Now, I get what you're thinking. I think I know what you're thinking. Maybe I know what you're thinking. But did that guy on stage just say, reduce your stress, nutrition, and exercise? I did. And I fully recognize that these three recommendations are made every day to every patient by every doctor. But think about what made them unique that afternoon. What made them unique was that these recommendations were the product of several meetings between MGG and the church. These recommendations were actionable because we took into account the community's resources, surroundings, and its culture. And these recommendations were reinforced long after that afternoon, not by doctors, not by MGG, but by the trusted community members of that church. And come to find out months later, several parish members lost weight, and one woman gave a testimony on a Sunday morning of how she got off all her blood pressure medications. Those outcomes, that's fulfillment. And for those of us at MGG, those outcomes remind us of why we became doctors. To date, Medicine for the Greater Good has worked with over 5,000 Baltimore City persons and over 200 medical trainees. And we're making a difference. At the patient level, remember Ms. R? Ms. R hasn't seen the inside of a hospital in over a year. Why? Well, we helped create effective medical strategies for her. One of her neighbors, he has a car, he drives once a month to pick up her prescriptions. Ms. R helped identify two women from her parish who are more than happy to cook her meals when she can't afford to. And Ms. R introduced us to the building's leadership and we launched a smoking cessation campaign there. At the community level, earning trust. Remember our failed cancer screening initiative? Well, we stayed persistent, we showed up to their monthly meetings, and eventually they said, yes, come back, implement some health initiatives, but on themes we're gonna select. We said, sure. And just last spring, we talked about breast cancer. And finally, to the trainees. To the trainees out there, I wanna leave you with this. Yes, the joy of medicine lies in the ability to care for a person. 
but the fulfillment of medicine lies in the ability to effectively care for that person. And to effectively care for them, you must know their community. Active community engagement, I promise you, will create a powerful transformation. You'll stop seeing yourselves as doctors treating the community, and you'll begin to see yourselves as community members who happen to be doctors. And that notion helps reaffirm MGG's formula. Know the science, know the patient, and know the community. The fulfillment of medicine through the complete understanding of our patients, that's medicine for the greater good. Thank you.